Hi, it's Cara Riley, and welcome to the Landscape Photography Show. This is the L F of evolution of the Landscape Photography Daily Photography theme page at Google+. And we are so excited today because we are going to have Mark Johnson. <laughs> That's who you saw when the video started. I'm in charge of the blue box, and uh, you, you, you got Mark to begin with, and he is a an Adobe Photoshop luminary. So we are going to learn all kinds of very fun things uh, about editing. And so we'll start the show by introducing our curators for the landscape photography theme. And we'll start here with Margaret Tompkins, who actually started this theme page. So Margaret in Kansas City, welcome. Hi there, Cara. Uh, really great to be with you today. And I know this is going to be an awesome show. I just think the world of Mark Johnson and the whole world needs to look at what he does and how he does it. Uh, really going to be fantastic. And I'm here in Kansas City. Uh, I'm retired and an amateur photographer. I've just been to the garden center and got me some new flowers. I'm going to go plant them and then I'm going to take photographs of them. So that's <laughs> my agenda for today. And it's so great to uh, uh, be here with you today. Welcome to Whoops. Landscape Photography. What's happening here? This is the L L oh, I don't evolution know. of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's one of those gremlins we were talking about. Live shows. <laughs> the, YouTube, the YouTube channel was open and it was on delay. So there we go. We have gremlins. They're done. <laughs> so Margaret's going to plant flowers and take pictures. We're, we're Absolutely. That's great. So now we're going to go here to Tom Harrell. So Tom, tell us where you are in the world. That's what's so fun about uh, Google Plus is we connect with people all over the country, all over the world. Now, oh, hi, Kara. Um, I'm located in Carmel, California. This is my first uh, participation in, in the show, so I'm glad to be here today. And I'm also looking forward to learning from Mark. I, I've seen some of the work on his website and. I think it, um, we're all going to learn a lot this morning, so I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Well, that's great. So here I'll, I'll come back. I, I'm Carl Riley, and uh, I'm the founder of the Photo Tour Global Directory. I'm a small business consultant and an aspiring amateur photographer who actually does not really know how to edit my photos. So now that we've put this all on the table, <laughs> we're going to introduce our guest today, who is going to make us all feel better uh, about what it is we can do with our photography to take it to the next level and that's a fun thing we were talking about in the green room of how, how important it is to actually be able to take those uh, photographs to a different level. Um, Mark is a, I loved this description, an Adobe Photoshop luminary. Yeah. That is such a great adjective because it makes the light shine and we've had uh, classes on light and uh, so he is an author and he's a passionate instructor and I think one of the things that touched me is that he's so genuine, so from the heart and so willing to help and we'll talk about all his free tutorials. I mean, it's just amazing the gift that he has for mm -hmm. us today. He's with the Rocky Mountain School of Photography, uh, the Radiant Vista, Boulder, Boulder Digital Arts, and he can be hired as a consultant individually. So today he's going to be talking about simulating a graduated neutral density filter. That's uh, over here for me, but <laughs> what we're going to learn, I'm, I'm so excited. The key, another key is replacing skies, and, and this past weekend we were on a photo tour at the Grand Canyon, and it was smoky, and the sunset, sunrise just really didn't happen, so Mark's going to help us with that. He's going to also be talking about content-aware scale to compress middle grounds, so I mean, there's some Greek for me, but I think one of the other great things about Mark he has appeared on the National Association of Photoshop Professionals. He's a uh, Planet Photoshop websites. He's been featured in Photo Technique, Nature's Best. Um, I think you've been with Jane Goodall. I mean, this 
These are amazing things that you work side by side by Adobe's chief executive officer um, and the U.S. ambassador to Finland, Academy Award winning director, um, Louis, and you've got to tell me that one, Mark. <laughs> so he is. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so it is my pleasure from my backyard in Colorado a long time ago. Um, Boulder, Colorado, we have Mark Johnson with us. Thank you, well, th Mark. Thank you so much, uh, Cara. It's, it really is an honor to uh, be invited to be on this show. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to be here, and, and I appreciate that wonderful introduction, but what I'd like to do right off the bat is just let everybody here know that none of those accolades, none of that stuff is what I am about. Um, what I am about is uh, a passion for creating. Uh, I use my camera and I use Photoshop to create images that resonate with me personally and that get me so excited that I can't help but share what I've learned with whoever is willing to listen. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody who's tuning into this show for being my audience and listening to what I have to say. I just, um, I love to I love to share. I do it enthusiastically, and um, and I like to do it in a very supportive and encouraging fashion. So, um, as I go through these tutorials today, I am going to um, begin at the very bottom, as if uh, as if a person doesn't know Photoshop at all, and I'm going to explain things in a very step by step fashion. I know we'll also have some experts who are tuning in. So I'll probably pitch out some keyboard shortcuts along the way, but um, but this is really going to be an inclusive and fun, exciting, inspiring uh, series of tutorials that I just can't wait to share with you. Great. Well, we're, we're excited, Mark. <laughs> so, Carl, yeah. should I go ahead? And, should I go ahead and dive right in to yeah, the tutorials? You should. And if anybody, we, we shared your photo this morning of the. A book coming right out of the beautiful green grass. What an image that was! <laughs> it's like, oh, well, luminary is is the word. So just start right in there, and yeah. we'll. And we love the fact that you're going to talk to us where we are, you know. And uh, just in our green room, Mark, we pick up things that we that we know, but the other person doesn't. And so anything you pick up, it's just. A marvelous. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm, I'm going to begin the process today um, by talking about how to simulate a graduated neutral density filter. Now, some of you have probably worked with uh, graduated filters. Others probably have no idea what they are. So let me first explain um, what that filter is and why you would use it. Um, as landscape photographers, we've all been in the field and we've seen beautiful uh, settings where perhaps there is a mountain range lit up with stunning alpenglow and the foreground is a meadow of wildflowers and so we want to grab this photograph but when we grab it with a single exposure you might find that although the mountains are exposed properly the meadow of wildflowers which is in the shade is just too dark and so, in the olden days, back when we were still using film, uh, we would use a graduated neutral density filter to knock back the exposure for those bright mountains so that it would be more consistent with the meadow of wildflowers in the foreground. So in other words, you're trying to equalize the exposures. Well, now that we're shooting digitally, we don't have as much need for the graduated neutral density filter. Uh, what we can do is we can get our camera up on the tripod and then we can shoot one exposure for the bright mountains and then a separate exposure for the meadow of wildflowers. So, you know, we're on the tripod, we're not, we're not moving the camera, the only thing that we're changing is the exposure. And you can change that however you like to change it. I recommend shooting an aperture priority so that, um, so that all you're doing is uh, you're, you're not changing the aperture or the, the depth of field. What you're doing is you're just changing the shutter speed 
to alter the exposure. So in other words, you know, you, you'll have a perfect exposure for the mountains in one shot, you'll have a perfect exposure for the meadow of wildflowers in the other shot, and then you can use Photoshop to very quickly integrate those two and have one just stunning shot. So that's what I want to show you. Does that make sense, what I'm talking about with the graduated neutral density filter? Yeah. No, yeah. it does. Yes, those dots have connected. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, the, the graduated neutral density filter is actually a rectangular piece of glass that is mm -hmm. smoked at the top and it's transparent at the bottom and there's sort of a subtle gra um, gradation between the smoked area that holds back the exposure and the transparent area at the bottom. But again, you don't need that filter. All you need is um, the passion to do this and Photoshop and, and the knowledge that I'm, I'm, I'm about to share right now. So I'm going to go ahead and Mark, share my um, screen. Yes, Tom? Mark, when you take your two shots, would you meter off the sky, then meter off the wildflowers to get the correct exposure for both? You could, although I, I find that um, metering in this digital age kind of puts me in my left brain. Um, I used to do a lot of metering in the film days. I, I like to stay in the right brain, the creative side, as much as possible. So I'll usually just fire one exposure, Tom. It will nail the mountains or the, or the meadow of wildflowers. It's going to nail one half of that scene uh, mm -hmm. because that's how good these cameras are. And then what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, it nailed the mountains. Now I need to shoot the wildflowers, which are too dark, so I need to open up. Um, I, I need to mm -hmm. open up and, and brighten the scene. And so um, in that situation, I'll usually just do a little quick exposure compensation, maybe a stop or two, fire a shot, look at the histogram, and make sure that I got all the nice detail um, in that meadow of wildflowers. But metering is, if you're used to metering, is something you like to do, you can absolutely do that, but I don't think it's essential. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and show you how you do this in Photoshop. All right. So we're going to be working with this scene that you see right here. Now, as you look at this scene, which was shot up um, in uh, Banff, Canada, uh, this is, I think this is actually Lake Louise. I shot it a while ago, but I think it's Lake Louise. And you'll notice that this particular exposure um, is, is pretty well done for the mountains. Actually, if I were to redo it, I'd probably hold back exposure there a little bit, but that can be controlled in Photoshop. So it's pretty well exposed for the mountains, but it's, it's dark in the foreground, particularly in the area where you see the boathouse with the canoe and the, um, and the building that's right there. So this exposure right here is nicely exposed for the foreground, but it's blown out on the mountains. So I'm going to take these two and combine them using Photoshop. Now what I'm going to do is um, I'm working out a bridge here, and I know a lot of you work out of Lightroom. If you work out of Lightroom, uh, you can do the exact same thing I'm doing right here to bring these two images over into Photoshop as a layered file. So I'm going to click on the first image, and then I'm holding down Command on the Mac or Control on the PC, and I'm going to image right there. And again, you can do the same thing in Lightroom. Now here in Bridge, I'm going to choose Tools, Photoshop, load files into Photoshop layers. Now, if you're in Lightroom, um, it's, I forget the exact, I'm not a Lightroom user, but I forget the exact menu choice, but when you control or right click on either one of those images that you've selected, um, you, you can choose to export those, um, those two files as a layered document. All right, so here is the image. You guys still there? Yeah. So yeah. Sometimes I think probably when you're using your keys, it does um, uh, mute you a little bit. But when you stop, then you come back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's. I'll try to. I'll try the to joy, work around the that. The joys of Hangouts on Air with all the new tools. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Well, let me know if if uh, if if you're having a hard time hearing anything. It's not coming through clearly. So, all right. Here I have the. Um, a two-layer document. So when I brought these images in, Photoshop layered them into one document for me. The top layer here 
represents the mountains. So I'm going to go ahead and call that what it is. I'm going to double click right here on the layer name and I'm going to type in the word mountains and I'll try not to talk when I do that because I know I'll get muted. No, I think it's the typing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now the bottom layer represents the foreground or the water. So I'll go ahead and name that appropriately by double clicking on the layer name and I'll type in water. All right. So we have our two layers named. We know what we're doing here. Next thing we want to do is we want to hide the part of the top layer, the mountains layer here. We want to hide the part of that layer that is underexposed and reveal the properly exposed water on the layer below. All right. The way that you hide something in Photoshop is by adding a layer mask. And a layer mask is wonderful because what it allows you to do is it allows you to apply black paint to the mask in areas where you want to hide part of that layer. So wherever there's black paint, the layer is hidden. And wherever there's white paint, the layer is visible. If there's gray paint on that mask, it means that that layer is partially visible and the layers below it are partially visible. So I'm going to add a layer mask by clicking on this icon right down here that is a front-loading washing machine icon. It says add layer mask. <laughs> All right, so I'm clicking on the front-loading washing machine. And it's going to add the mask to this top layer, the active layer. Now, in order to hide this, I could either paint with a black brush or I could save time by running a gradient through the mask where the black part of the gradient represents what, I've, what I'm trying to hide on this layer, which is the inferior foreground, and the white represents what I'm trying to maintain. So I'm going to come over here to the gradient tool right here. And I'm going to pop up to the options bar right here running across the top of the screen just below the menus. And I'm going to do a gradient that is black to white. So this is the black to white gradient right here. Then I'm going to use the linear gradient. So if I point to this icon right here, this one is the linear gradient. So I'm going to use that. Um, now, when I look at this scene, what I'm trying to hide is this underexposed foreground area. The angle of light here is actually it's not your, your typical kind of horizon. Um, it's, it's actually at an angle. So the key is that when you run your gradient through here, you want to be perpendicular with your gradient to the existing horizon of, of the uh, light that you're seeing here. So you want to be perpendicular. I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. Now, uh, before I actually run the gradient through this layer, we're going to take a tiny tangent and I'm going to show you how the gradient works. So this is not part of the technique, I just want to show you this. I've added a blank new layer here and I'm going to show you how a gradient works. If I click at the bottom of my document and hold the shift key so I can draw a straight line, there we go. Okay, we lost you while you were drawing. Okay. There, no. Um, so if you, if you were saying something while you were bringing your black, we, we didn't hear it. Letting me know. So what I'm going to do here is hold the shift key, and then I am going to click and drag a long gradient across this document. I want you to see what happens here. So here goes. See how that is a very long, gradual gradient? Well, watch what happens if I drag a shorter distance. Here we go. See how I get a much more ab abrupt transition when I drag a short distance. So keep in mind that black on the mask hides the current layer revealing what's below. So when you look 
at this layer, and you're working on this mask, is the transition of light, and this is a question, feel free to answer, is the transition of light very um, rapid, very abrupt, or is it long and slow? What would you say? It's fairly abrupt. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, so it's abrupt. That means you want to drag a very short gradient here so that um, you're, you're working with that very quick transition. So it's almost like you're putting a hard-edged uh, graduated neutral density filter in here instead of a long, slow, gradual um, graduated neutral, neutral density filter. So let me show you here. I'm going to uh, pull a gradient, and I'm going perpendicular to the light that you see right here. I'm going to pull my gradient perpendicular to that light, and I'm going to pull it a very short distance, and watch what happens. So what happened here is I just laid a gradient in that looks like this. So there's my gradient. It's consistent with the hard edge of light that we have there. If that had been a more gradual transition of light, I would have done something like this. But in this case, it's a hard transition of light, so you drag a short distance like this. And now let me show you how, what's visible about the top layer. That's what's still visible about the top layer. It's the part that you care about, the part that you actually want to use from, so that's the proper exposure for the mountains. And then you're getting the proper exposure from the layer below for the water right here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Promise? Promise. It does. For one who knows nothing, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Had the concept down, but it's like you're masking off what you don't want to show up, and then you're putting it together. You're building a puzzle. That's right. Exactly. You're building a puzzle. You have two layers. One is the one represents the properly exposed top. One is the properly exposed bottom of the scene. And then using the mask, you're turning each layer into the appropriate puzzle piece. Yes. So the top layer is now um, the top puzzle piece. And that's all that's visible from that top layer, um, the mountains. And then the bottom layer, all that's visible from it is the properly exposed water. So it's the water puzzle piece. And you've just brought the two together. And you did it with a mask and a gradient, keeping in mind that black paint on the mask hides the current layer and reveals the layer below. Yeah? yeah. So that's Great. the idea. Do you guys have any questions about that before I move on? That, that was a good start. And, you know, in the green room we were talking, um, Mark, as people are watching this, tell us about your 101 tutorial that they're going to be able to access for free. Yeah, so for anybody who is um, new to Photoshop or intimidated by Photoshop, which, by the way, if you're intimidated by Photoshop, um, I want to encourage you to give it a try, just make sure that you tap into the right resources. And by right resources, I mean um, resources like my Photoshop 101 series that, um, that explain things in very plain English um, from the ground up and only show you the tools that you absolutely need as a photographer to create what you want. In other words, Photoshop is daunting because there are so many tools and possibilities. Right. But as photographers who have set goals, really what you want to do, instead of trying to take on Photoshop and learn all the tools and all the menus, what you want to do is you want to say, here's my goal. I want to learn how to do this. I want to know how to do color correction. Where can you find the resource? I want to know how to do you know, very basic Photoshop. Where can you find the resource? And Carl, responding to your comment a moment ago, the Photoshop 101 series is on my website. Um, I, I believe Carl will share a link after this is all said and done, but um, it's msjphotography.com. And once you're there, if you click on the Learn tab at the top of the page, you will come to a page where running down the right side, you'll see a listing of all my tutorials. And you'll find the Photoshop 101 tutorial series, which is free, by the way. 
um, on or in the right column of that page. So that's great for beginners. I mentioned color correction as well. Uh, if anybody really wants to learn color correction in Photoshop, I just finished about three weeks ago recording a series on color correction uh, in Photoshop. That one is a more extensive series than Photoshop 101, so it's what I call a premium tutorial series. So you'll find that one in my bookstore under, um, I think it's under video tutorial series um, or video tutorials. But, um, you know, so as a new person to Photoshop, target what you need, find the right resource, whether it's me or some of these other great experts that are out there, and just tap into kind of one thing at a time, take baby steps, don't get overwhelmed, and you're, you're going to you're gonna wind up loving it, I think. So, Mark, the, um, the, the, the thing that you just talked about that really resonated with me was um, the color correction. Uh, we went to the painted desert about two or three weeks ago, and it was white sky, and it wasn't very pretty. So for color correction, then I can go to your um, bookstore and find what I need to correct my color on the Painted Desert. Absolutely, yeah. If you go okay. to my store, which is a tab at the top of the um, of msjphotography.com. Uh, I, I think what you're doing is this is almost like cliff notes for Photoshop, which I know <laughs> when people are starting to learn at a, a different age, <laughs> we, we process our, our learning skills are different, and we really just need to know. You know, my husband. I need to know husband. What he needs to know, I tell him, right? <laughs> but the, what we need to know is what time it is, not how to build the watch. And right. that's what, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yes, that's that is yeah. exactly it. And um, you know, I think well, we live in a day and age here of of um, you know so many things competing for our attention. One of the things that I love most about uh, this period in time is. You know, when I want to know something, when anybody needs to know something, you can go to Google and yes. you can keyword you search can it and it gonna, it's going to bring up content. And that is beautiful, but it's even more useful if, uh, if you're able to have somebody direct you to a resource <laughs> that um, is taught by somebody who um, is going to make it easy to digest. <laughs> and so, you know, that's what I try my best to do with my video tutorial series, whether they're the free ones or the premium ones. That's what I try to do. There are other great people out there. Um, I think there's room for a lot of people in this world, uh, a lot of great voices. So if anybody wants to uh, learn about great resources, I have a lot of opinions <laughs> about some <laughs> wonderful instructors that are available, and I'm happy to share that information um, at any point in time. <laughs> I think this, this is marvelous in that it's, um, I always thought, uh, like Photoshop is a very intimidating product. I mean, there's a gazillion features and um, sliders all over the place, and you can mix and match and do all sorts of things. And I use probably 2% of the functionality that's there, kind of like um, uh, Microsoft Word. Yeah. Uh, I, I use about 2%, and I can do an awful lot with that 2%, but at least that gets me started. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I really do think, uh, you know, as a photographer, particularly somebody who's new to Photoshop or new to photography, you know, you need to tap into maybe uh, 10, 15 percent of what Photoshop has mm -hmm. to offer, and that's all you really need to focus on. And then, you know, if you decide to push further, like, you know, like I say, my passion reaches far and wide because I've been using Photoshop now for 20 some years. Uh, you know, if you want to get into compositing and things like that, then you need to learn new tools. But don't try to take those on <laughs> in the beginning is just is just yeah. plain overwhelming so uh, yeah it, it, it's 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 awesome we're in a great great period yeah. in time when so many wonderful resources and instructors are available and, oh it's it's exciting and and the the what we can now do with digital photography and Photoshop and Lightroom um, the immediacy of everything is oh, what a special period <laughs> Okay, now here, here's a question from someone who, um, you know, just doesn't know the difference. Now, the difference in Lightroom versus Photoshop for the layers, just like you said, can you do that same thing in Lightroom or no? 
Um, what I just showed you with the layers, that's a, that is a Photoshop thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, On One Software has created something called Perfect Layers for Lightroom. It's, um, I haven't worked with it, but it's, it's essentially a plug-in for Lightroom that allows some layer functionality within Lightroom. I, since I haven't worked with it, I can't really comment on that, but it might be worth it if somebody doesn't want to get into Photoshop, they just want to work with Lightroom. It might be worth looking at both Photoshop, which will give you the world if you decide to go for it, or look at um, Perfect Layers from On One Software and see if that gives them the functionality to do what they need. Um, what we just did there was simply two layers in a mask. So I suspect that something like Perfect Layers would give you that capability without having to invest in Photoshop. I think Lightroom does have their um, local adjustment um, graduated neutral density tool that um, you just use the one image and you can um, have a local adjustment where you can change the exposure within a portion of that image. So you're, you're hoping there's enough dynamic range within your RAW file to allow you to get to be where you want to get get to, but it's it's not as powerful as uh, what Mark just showed us. Yeah, that's a great comment, Tom. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's uh, both Lightroom's develop module and uh, pho Photoshop's, um, what ships with Photoshop is called Adobe Camera Raw, ACR. Mm -hmm. ACR and Lightroom's develop module are almost identical, and they both have a um, graduated filter in there that will allow you to uh, darken or lighten a region like what we just did but the key to that working as Tom mentioned is you have to have enough uh, information in your original capture for that to, to um, actually work and in these graduated neutral density techniques oftentimes the scenes that you're photographing have such a range of contrast of brightness values that you really need two exposures so it'll be scene dependent <laughs> Well, good, and we'll we'll go on to your next uh, <clears throat> your next feature of what you're going to help us with, and just letting our audience know we had Jeff Bedeau, uh join us uh, from the curating team, the landscape photography curating team. Jeff, you're muted, you, and you you can unmute yourself now that you got in, and if you have questions or additions, <laughs> and for Mark, he's just been wonderful. So thanks for joining us, Jeff. Glad to have you, have you here, Jeff. And, and Cara, I think you're going to like this um, this next topic. It's going to be really yes. pertinent based upon your your um, your Grand Canyon shoot. As photographers, you know, we all know that we work very hard. We get up early in the morning to get to spectacular destinations, mm -hmm. and we have limited time at those destinations. And Mother Nature does what she does. Sometimes we're delivered stunning beauty. Sometimes we have skies that are <laughs> severely clear blue skies or they are completely washed out gray ugly skies in scenarios like that where you don't have the opportunity to grab that scene with the beautiful light that you'd like to have um, I'm going to show you a couple of techniques here for replacing skies and what I'm going to do uh, time permitting is I'm going to show you kind of a best case scenario technique and I'm going to show you a worst case scenario technique because uh, sometimes you have a very clean horizon. For instance, this, what I'm about to show you, I, I shot in uh, Death Valley on the dunes. I had a very clean horizon. Replacing the sky there, not hard. But then I'm going to show you a scene where I have a tree with a million branches reaching above the horizon, and I want to replace that sky. So I'll show you how to approach that as well. So we have two great uh, opportunities to see how to um, replace skies when Mother Nature just doesn't cooperate and you don't have enough time to stick around. So let me go ahead and dive back into screen sharing and show you what I mean. Okay, here we are. So, in the best case scenario, we have a setting like this where there is a clean delineation between uh, the dune and the mountains in in this case, and the sky. And well, so, we're still seeing black. We're okay. fading to black right now, so um, oh, okay. I just want to click off and then back on your screen yeah. share. Let me pop over there and turn. 
it, this happens sometimes. It just takes a little while to process. Oop, I think we lost Mark. There's... <laughs> we did. He'll be coming back. <laughs> so while he's gone, Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself um, to our viewers while we're waiting? You're, you're muted. So just go up to the top on the right and click your microphone. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? There you go. So introduce yourself while we're waiting for Mark to come back. All right, um, I'm Jeff Beto, and I'm from uh, Minneapolis, or Bloomington, Minnesota. And uh, if I could, I'd hold up my computer so you could see the clean windows in my studio today because <laughs> I spent the morning cleaning them. So I do well, windows. Well, great. <laughs> Jeff, thanks. Now Mark's back. So yeah. Mark, good, good time of your disappearance and introducing Jeff. And so now you're back. back. Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, let's see if my screen share works a little, a little more cleanly here. I am getting a little um, audio feedback. So keep me posted as to if this seems to be working right yeah, now. Yeah. Well, we're getting somebody's got uh, some speaker open because we're getting huge feedback. So maybe Jeff, you might want to mute yourself. I don't know if you've got something on. There we go. Seems to be okay. resolved. All right. Now, and um, can you see a picture from Death Valley, the dunes? No, you yes. see me. <laughs> oh. No, I see, I see the uh, dunes. I, I'm in front of your Death Valley on my screen. How about you, Tom? There. Now we see it. Now we see okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Well, um, and again, just keep me keep me posted if, if things, things aren't showing up as I'm speaking about them. But basically, okay. here we have a scene where... Um, there's a real clear clear delineation between the foreground elements, which are the dunes, and the um, and the middle ground elements, which are the mountains and the sky. And so, in this scenario, this is what I call kind of a best case scenario, but uh, in terms of replacing the sky. But you know, we have a severely clear sky on this day, and I'd like to have some texture up there. So, um, what I'm going to do is open up the dune shot. Let me actually close out this other one. Okay, so here is the dune shot. And I'm going to begin this process by making a selection of that blue sky. Lots of different ways to make selections in Photoshop. One of the very best ways to make probably 90% of your selections is something called the Quick Selection Tool. Now, I'm going to go over that tool right now. and. Uh, it's right here. Is everybody seeing the quick selection tool and the dunes on the screen here? No, we're back to the water uh, in the uh, mountain. Now, now we're back to the um, sand dune. Okay, but so we don't see to, your tool yet. Seems to be a little bit of lag in what I'm saying and what you're seeing. So um, I'll just talk extra slowly. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I, um, I'm pointing at the Quick Selection tool, which is located just below the Lasso tool. And um, I'm going to use this Quick Selection tool to select that blue sky. And when you have a nice uh, contrast between your foreground and your sky, like I have right here, you're going to be amazed how easy this process is. So I've got my Quick Selection tool. I can size this tool using the right bracket key on my keyboard to make it bigger or the left bracket key to make it smaller. So right bracket key bigger, left bracket key smaller. I would say if there's one keyboard shortcut you want to learn in Photoshop, that is it. Because you're going to be changing the size of your brushes mm -hmm. and the size of your other tools on a regular basis. Okay, so I'm going to make this maybe a little bit larger by tapping the right bracket key. And that makes it larger. Yep, that makes it larger. And, left and now I am going to paint over the sky. And look at that. I made a stroke that was, you know, a few centimeters, and it selected that entire sky because we're in the best case scenario right here. Um, once you have that sky selected, you can then go to your other image, your sky picture, which, by the way, when you're out in the field, if you think you might have a need for uh, replacing skies, improving skies, then 
shoot skies while you're out there and try to shoot them with lenses that have a similar focal length to what you would actually use for your landscape, whatever style you, um, you work with in terms of focal length, shoot your skies that way. Try to shoot all kinds of different skies and um, keep in mind that when you are compositing, like what we're doing right now, a sky into another scene, keep in mind that the angle of light needs to be consistent between the current foreground and the sky you're about to drop in. So where would you say my light is coming from in this Death Valley Dune scene? Is it coming from the uh, right or left? From the right. 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 So it's coming right. from the light, or the, the light, the right. So that means <laughs> that uh, I want to add in a sky where the light is coming from the same side. So I'm going to go grab that sky. Okay, so well, he's while he's grabbing his sky, you know what makes sense now at Google Plus is all these theme pages. The Sunday sky theme is so that you take <laughs> skies and have them in your inventory. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And you know, another thing that, um, that I do from time to time, I mean, I love to photograph everything I possibly can on my own. But um, sometimes in life, you simply don't have the resource that you need. And so um, I think it's perfectly wonderful and fine. And again, you need to be transparent with your process um, with your audience. But I think it's perfectly fine to go to a stock site and get a sky if that's what you need to do because you do not own that sky and you don't have the ability to get out there. I think it makes more sense to be able to allow yourself to create images even if you have to um, become part of a creative community that's going to help support you by um, maybe another photographer photograph that sky and you're going to integrate it into your scene. Everybody's going to have different feelings about that, but um, I just would encourage you not to limit yourself. Allow yourself to be creative, whatever that means to you. And so um, that's what we're going to do here. We're going to take this sky and we're going to drop it into the other scene. So I need to select this sky which means I'm going to go up to the select menu and choose, and choose all. So select all. Okay? Did that, did you see me actually go to the select menu there? Yes. Yes. Great. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> now I'm going to choose edit, copy. All right, so it was select all, now edit, copy. Now I'm going to go over to my other document the one where I'm replacing the sky, right here. And I am going to paste my new sky into this selected area. So I'll choose Edit, Paste Special, Paste Into. So the key here is you want to choose Edit, Paste Special, Paste Into. So not, not just a straight paste, but you're actually pasting into the Marching Ants selection. All right. There's my new sky. Now, wow. Adobe, when they wrote this software, they were really smart. They knew that when you pay, or they know that when you paste into a selected area, that you may want to move your subject within that selected area, within that window of sky up there. You might want to move your subject. So they automatically unlinked the mask, which is our hole. So they unlink the mask, which is cutting the hole there. Remember, white is what's visible about that layer. And they unlink that mask from this picture, from the new sky. So they unlink. That happened right here, right between the picture thumbnail and the mask thumbnail. There is a link. Adobe made that go away. And they did it um, intelligently because they know that we might want to move that sky. They also made it naturally, or, or by default, uh, happen that this sky thumbnail is selected. So everything I just showed you there, it's great to know that, but ultimately, if you want to move your sky after you do the paste into step, all you have to do is click on the move tool right here, and then click and drag your sky. And you it's like you're dragging within a little window here. It's like your cover photo on Google Plus. You can move it around. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. So you can position that. You can position those clouds wherever you want them, and you can get the sky that you want up there. Again, you want to make sure the angle of light is consistent. Now, one thing that will happen, even in the best case scenario, is if you zoom your picture to 100% magnification, which means that you're viewing it with every bit of detail that you could possibly ever see on the printed page, and you go to 100% magnification, you're seeing all the detail that would ever show up on a printed page. Um, if you do that, you're going to notice there might be a little hairline between um, the new sky and the old sky, uh, or between the new sky and the horizon. So I'm going to zoom to 100%. The trick for doing that quickly is to double click on the zoom tool. So I'll move over here to the zoom tool, which is near the base of the tools panel, and I'll double click on the zoom tool to zoom to 100%. Now, if I want to move around my screen, I can click on the hand tool here and drag around the screen, or for those of you who like and are ready for keyboard shortcuts, simply hold the space bar and it will turn. By holding the space bar, it will turn whatever tool you're using into the hand, and then you can click and drag. So. Now, I know our resolution is not all that great here, so I'm actually going to zoom this past 100%. Do you see a little tiny line on your monitors? Do you see a little line here mm -hmm. between the uh, sand dune and the uh, new sky? Yeah. Yes. It's just slightly, yeah. Slight. Let me go even tighter. All right. So there is a little tiny uh, hairline right there. The way that you eliminate that hairline is this. This is so cool, by the way. Um, you want to activate the mask, because remember, the mask is what's hiding part of your new sky. And the reason that you have that little tiny hairline is because your mask isn't revealing quite enough of the new sky. In other words, it's still showing a tiny sliver of the old sky here. So I am going to work on the mask, which means I will click on this thumbnail that I'm pointing to right now, the one that um, represents the mask rather than the thumbnail that represents the picture itself or the pixels. So I've, I'm, I'm on the mask. That's very important. Now I'm going to choose Select Refine Mask. Okay, so go under the Select menu and choose Refine Mask. This is an amazing dialogue in Photoshop. It allows you to do so many things <laughs> that I, I could spend hours talking about this dialogue. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to change our view here so that it says on layers. By choosing the on layers view, we're seeing our composite of the new sky and the sand dune here. We're seeing that composite actually as it is. So we're working on this. It's like having a, a live real-time preview of what's going on here. So we're on layers. And is everybody still with me? I just want to check mm -hmm. in. Yep, we are. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And now if I want to reposition this little hairline, in other words, I want to, I want to erode the sand dune a few millimeters here so that I'm not seeing the old sky visible. I can come to shift edge right down here and I can drag this slider to the right. It has now shifted my edge and I don't know if you can see that very well because it's I know resolution in these hangouts isn't all that great, but it actually pushed the edge of my mask so that I'm no longer seeing that old sky there. I'm going to show you another way of looking at this in a moment. One it little actually arc. looks like little lines of the sand have blended into the new sky. It does. There's it does. No there is one artifact that's that's appeared here, and it's very common that this will happen. Um, what you're seeing is the little sort of um, lines of the sand, which works for this particular subject, but won't work for every subject you're working on. Um, those are kind of jagged edges created yes. by the quick selection tool. If I want to smooth out those edges, well, lo and behold, <laughs> there is a smooth slider right here. So if I drag the smooth slider to the right, and I'm going to go too far so you can really see it smooth out. Those little tiny things that we were referring to as sort of um, ripples in the dune a moment ago, they're gone now. Right. 
it has smoothed that out. The other thing that you're going to encounter in this process is the edge might be a little bit too hard, maybe not consistent with the other edges in the picture at that point in the um, distance. You know, you might have other edges that are softer or harder than this edge. You want to be consistent with those edges. You can create that consistency using the feather slider to soften your edge or the contrast slider to harden your edge. So if I go to feather here and I move it, and again, I'm going to be a little radical so you can really see this, and I move it to the right, it has now softened my transition. It is blending my edge. It's blended way more than I think it should for this scene, but that's because I just wanted to illustrate um, what it does. Now I'm going to back it off to something that I think is actually appropriate. Tom, could I, I mean, uh, Mark, could I interject something? Sure, here? yeah. Uh, what I find when I'm using this is it has to do with is that edge of the dune in focus relative to the rest of the image? Absolutely. And if the edge of the if the edge of the dune is in sharp focus, then you go tighter with less feathering. If it naturally is out of focus because your foreground's more in focus, then you can use more feathering and you can simulate the out of focus edge with a feathering tool. Absolutely, absolutely agree. That is um, so true. So, yeah, if you think of it, um, and, and who was that who just commented? That, was that Tom or was that? That was that Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. The, um, yeah, the one Adam. with the headphones. I got my headphones on now. Are you rocking out right now or what's going <laughs> yeah. on there? <laughs> he was giving us some feedback. He just wanted to, you know, get us stressed out a little bit. <laughs> uh, so, so um, yeah, you're right. If that edge is out of focus, then you're going to do exactly what he said. You're going to feather it a little more. If it's supposed to be a really sharp edge, instead of moving the feather slider, you might move the contrast slider a little bit. Um, but your goal is to create something, uh, an edge back there that looks consistent with other edges. Mm -hmm edges that are at that distance or at that a level of focus in your scene. So um, that is exactly right. Now, if you had maybe some shrubs or some trees along that this horizon, the other slider that I would look at here, and we don't have this, we don't have it in this particular example, but uh, this radius slider right here does a really good job of snapping your your new sky in around the edges of a tree or a shrub or something like that. So definitely think about the radius slider if you have a scenario that's not as perfect world as this one, um, but not as horrible as what I'm going to show you in just a, a few moments if I have time. But um, the radius slider is great for that. Now what we want to do is we want to output this change to the mask to the layer mask itself. So down here where it says output to, we want to set this pull down menu to layer mask, which it's already set to, so I don't need to make a change. And I'm going to press OK. And I want to show you, first of all, here is before. So that's a moment ago. You're, um, hopefully you're seeing the little hairline there. And then here is after. So here is after right here. Yeah, now, there's, no, there's no hairline. Okay, yeah, and let me show you what happened to the mask, okay? So here's before on the mask. You can see it's a little jagged because of the quick selection tool. Here's after. So you can see how it smoothed out the transition there. And um, bearing in mind that the white on this mask represents where you're seeing the new sky, and the black on this mask represents where you're seeing none of the new sky, therefore you're seeing down to the original photograph which contains the sand dune. Was that a keyboard shortcut you used for the before and after? Um, the before and after, I'm just using Command Z on the Mac or Control Z on the PC and every time okay. I tap Command or Control Z I get um, an undo, redo, undo, redo, just like that. Okay. The other keyboard shortcut I used here is I held down Option on the Mac and Alt on the PC, and I clicked on the mask to add the mask. So okay. Option or Alt, and click the mask, and you can actually see the mask. And then if you do Option or Alt again, you'll be back to regular. So does that make sense? Yes, that's yes. awesome. 
and we can make an executive decision here. Um, we've got Mark, and usually our show is an hour, and people can stop the show anytime um, and come back. You know, so what do you think? Do you think we should just go on? He had three things to share with us. Just go ahead and go on. What's what's the group decision here? I say go uh, on if, if if Mark uh, can do it. Yeah, if you're if you're willing, Mark, let's just go ahead. And if people can't get it all in one sitting, they can stop and come back because it's all um, recorded on the um, YouTube channel. So just yeah. go. Let's go with it. Yeah, we're, I'd be happy. I'd be happy it. to push forward. I I, um, I actually have got two more things I want to show you. One is a worst worst case scenario sky replacement. And then we can make another decision after I do that if we want to go on to. Well, the yeah, as long as you're willing to teach, because we can just use it in segments. And we're, I'm here for you, even okay. if everybody else goes. <laughs> like, all right, I'm here. Okay. Well, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this document and I'm going to go into the worst case scenario. All right. That's what I work with every day. Is the worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, in the in sort of the. the middle case scenario we would do just what I did there uh, but we would use that um, radius slider in the refined mass dialog uh, um, a lot more than I just did there I didn't use it all there and we'd use that radius slider more um, if anybody out there is interested in how to make extremely precise selections of difficult subjects yes. Um, I have several resources on my site. First of all, each Thursday I release a free Photoshop Workbench tutorial on a subject that I'm fired up about. And if you just search um, keywords such as hair or um, compositing, you're going to find tutorials that address how to make selections of difficult subjects. For those of you who really want to take this to the next level, you're just you love the idea of being able to control your selections in Photoshop. I have another premium video tutorial series in my bookstore that is um, that is called Dramatic Portrait Compositing. Even if you're not a portrait um, photographer, that is where I go under the hood and I really show you how to make um, great selections. Uh, but again, the free Photoshop Workbench resources on my site, check those. I do compile those into DVDs or digital downloads coming up this fall. And um, so it's, it's possible to gain access to, to those where you can actually download them, um, have them available on you know, whatever uh, device you need them on at any point in time, no matter if you're flying through the air or not. So uh, the resources are there. Anyway, so best or worst case scenario. Here is a scene with a tree mm. uh, extraordinarily difficult to select. Yeah. In fact, I would encourage you, I've been doing this for 20 some years, I would encourage you to not even bother <laughs> trying to make a selection of that tree. Um, it, it would be possible, it would be possible, but it's going to be really difficult because if you zoom in, see all the, the fine details that are in there and that's just mm -hmm. you know certain things in Photoshop you have to know when to say when and um, so trying to make a selection of this isn't going to be the answer what we're going to rely upon for this technique is one of Photoshop's miraculous blend modes the blend modes blend the new sky with the old scene and in kind of the um, we're working on the worst case scenario here, right? But in the best case scenario for this type of situation, a blend mode will blend into your old sky with no more than a few um, keyboard clicks, and you're done. And and when that happens, you can just you can call all your friends and tell them how happy you are. I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant, beautiful thing when that happens. Um, in most situations, a blend mode will get you part of the way there. It will help you out with your sky replacement but it won't necessarily fix the problem without you going in and doing a little bit more work so let me show you what I mean by that
All right, so I want to bring this sky that you see right here. I want to bring this sky into that scene. Now, I know, because of the challenge of the edges in that other scene and trying to make a selection in there, that I'm not going to be able to get this sky into that scene looking exactly like this. But I'm going to be taking kind of the essence of this sky and importing it into the sky of the other scene. So again, as before, I'm going to choose Select All, Edit, Copy. I'll go over to my other document, and I'll choose Edit, Paste. Now sometimes when you bring a new sky in, it's not going to be the same size as, as um, what you're working with. If that's the case, you'll choose Edit, Transform, Scale. Or you can, some people are used to working with Free Transform, that's fine too. Edit Transform Scale or Edit Free Transform. Either one is going to work. I don't actually need to scale this, so I'm not going to take the time to go through that process, but I will let you know that when you go to scale your sky, um, you're going to be grabbing the side handles, the corner handles, and you're going to be scaling it. Um, if you don't hold the Shift key down when you do that, it's going to be changing the proportion, um, the aspect ratio of your sky. When it comes to skies, that's oftentimes fine. It's not fine when you're um, compositing other subjects, but, uh, but it's okay with skies. So you're going to grab corner handles, side handles, and you're going to be able to resize it. When you're done resizing it, you'll tap return on the Mac or enter on the PC, and you'll have your, your sky sized appropriately. In this case, I don't need to do that. So um, I have my new sky here on the top layer, and there's my scene where I'm trying to replace this sky. Again, I'm not trying to make a selection because I know it's just going to be a real struggle to do that. So what I'm going to do here is hope that a blending mode helps me out. To cycle through the blend modes in Photoshop, you can either click up here where it says normal and manually cycle through the choices, or what I really prefer to the process of manually cycling through is a keyboard shortcut um, that will allow you to do this much, much faster and with a lot more ease. So instead of manually cycling, cycling through the blend modes, what I'm going to do is activate the Move tool, which is available at the top of the Tools panel here. And now I'm going to hold down Shift, and I'm going to tap Plus. Now, I might get muted when I start pounding away on the keyboard here. So what I want you to look out for are this menu right over here, the blend mode menu, will change. And you're going to notice that the way this new sky blends with the old sky is going to be altered with each blend mode. Watch what happens here. Oh. I was going to say we have a psychedelic sky. Yeah, some. <laughs> now we have a dark sky. I'm seeing Cara, but not the uh, screen. Cara, you're you're front and center. Oh well, um, I'm seeing uh, all of his changes, so I must go different uh, different ways. Mark, how about you? What are you seeing? Well, I'm I'm just seeing my Photoshop. I'm I'm changing the. Uh, oh, Margaret. Or, oh, or Margaret. Tom. Sorry. Yeah. Are you? Uh, seeing I'm seeing his photograph now, but I had to select it. Otherwise, I was seeing you. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not typing anything. And the blue box is on Mark. So just okay. click on Mark. Click on I'm Mark. Back on, okay. I'm back on Mark. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're don't, you, don't you love the little hurdles? <laughs> these are the gremlins, and these are the we're learning things on each show that we're we're uh, learning. Thank you for being uh, patient with us. Yeah. So as it turns out, on this particular scene, you're going to notice that overlay blend mode, which is probably if you had to pick one blend mode to you know take to that deserted island, this is the one you would take. Overlay blend mode is marvelous, and in this case. What it allowed, let me show you. Here's, here's before the new sky, 
and here is after. Notice how, and I hope the we we lost you, Mark, vocally. Oh, okay, you lost me. Okay, start. You you were just saying notice how, and then okay. we lost. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Notice how the new sky has blended in among those tiny fine lines, those little tree branches that you wow. see there. The new sky has blended in simply by changing my blend mode here to overlay. I, I mean, that is absolutely miraculous that it blended that yeah. sky in there. Um, but overlay blend mode did that for me. Now, let me show you something. So here is before the new sky, and here is after the new sky. Now, it well, we got backwards. That there's your be there's your after. Yeah. Yep. So you should be seeing the after right now. Yeah. I think there's just maybe a little lag here. Yes. So um, anyway, that is the new sky. But one thing you'll notice if you look at any of your foreground elements, um, and in this case, it's the cathedral in Saint Paul. Uh, if you look at that uh, cathedral, it is getting some of right. the new sky. And maybe you don't want it. Oh, new sky. yeah. So, I mean, I, I actually like the way it looks here. It's imparting it's like some kind light of, shining on it. Yeah. Kind of magical light. It works for me, but I want to pretend that it doesn't work for you. If it doesn't work for you, you know, where that new sky is overlapping into your old horizon and it's not working. Um, what you can do is simply mask the new sky away from that area below the horizon. And in mo most cases, you can mask using the brush. You don't have to make a precise selection for this. Sometimes you do, but more often than not, you can just add a mask, paint with a big black soft brush, and your job is done. So that's what I'll do right now, especially given the amount of time that we're taking here. So uh, I am going to add a mask. If you remember, you do that by clicking on the front-loading washing machine icon that's right down here at the base of the layers panel. So that is how I'm going to add a mask to the new sky layer. You need to make sure you have the new sky layer active for this to work. Mark, now I'm going to right. pop over. We have a question here from uh, Jeff. Yeah. Yes. With, this with this particular set, with a, with a given image and the, the secondary image that you're using, what would happen if you used the dark and blend mode? The dark yeah. and blend mode, in theory, should give you that sky and leave the cathedral alone without having to do a mask or there, something. There is, there is dark in and as you can okay, see, the color is messed it, up. Yeah, yeah, it it you're you're right. Like uh, in theory, you're right because okay, darken won't go in and affect those pixels that are darker than the new sky. But as you can see in this case, darken imparts this really nasty color because of the way it's blending. Really with nasty. Original <laughs> original blue sky. So kind of twilight, things. twilight yeah. air. <laughs> and that's why I encourage everyone to use that keyboard shortcut. Activate the move tool, hold down the shift key and tap plus and it'll cycle you through the blend modes. You don't have to have any understanding of the blend modes to um, actually just witness what happens in front of your eyes and you might stumble across a blend mode that gets you where you need to go or at least gets you really close. Um, so now I'm going to come over here to the brush tool. So I've added the mask just a moment ago. I'm, I'm grabbing the brush tool. I want to set black as my foreground color because you paint with the foreground color. I can do that by clicking here on the tiny little default foreground and background um, icon that you see there and then clicking on the icon next to it that has the sort of curved arrow that will swap the colors back and forth. For those of you who like keyboard shortcuts, D gives you the default foreground and background colors and X exchanges them. So you want black as your foreground color. You come up here to the options bar. You want to be working with a soft edge brush, which is just this upper left hand choice, the soft round upper left hand choice there. And you're painting with 100% opacity, 100% flow. Now, who remembers the keyboard shortcut for resizing your brush? 
um, bracket, right. the bracket right is bigger and bracket. the left is smaller. That's right, exactly. So I'm going to make this bigger by tapping the right bracket key. Bracket key. There we go. Now I'm going to paint very quickly over my, I'm calling this my what's below the horizon, whatever that might be for you. I'm going to paint over it. If I need to get more detailed, I'll tap the left bracket key. Make it smaller. Make it smaller. And I can paint up into these areas. I feel like I'm painting away some warm, beautiful light from this actual scene, but um, in most cases, you're going to be really grateful <laughs> for painting away the, these little areas where you have the sky kind of overlapping into your horizon. So there it is. I just did some quick painting. Now when I turn visibility on and off for the uh, new sky, you can see the new sky is impacting the old sky, and it's fitting nicely in between those tiny tree branches up there, but it's not touching your elements below the horizon, in this case, the cathedral. Wow. Does that, does that make sense? That's yes. amazing. I, I'm no longer fearful of Photoshop. Look what you've done for me. <laughs> That's, I, I think I have a tear coming out of my eye right now. So. Oh, yes, my, my uh, <laughs> iPhoto little round uh, blusher. <laughs> now I can say, oh, I know how to get that paintbrush. <laughs> yeah, so you really, I mean, here you're, you're importing your new sky. You're cycling through the blend modes. Where it doesn't work perfectly, you're adding a mask and you're painting with black paint. And you can see in this scenario, I mean, uh, without the blend mode trick that we did here, trying to make a selection of that sky, I mean, you would be pulling your hair out. So this is this has the potential to save you a lot of time and grief if um, if you give oh, this a shot. I, I'll never have a bad shot again. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, do we have time for me to show you how to compress a middle ground? Yeah, just go ahead and anybody who's watching, you can, you know, need to go do something and then come back and get a follow up later. So yes, if you're willing to do it, we'd, we'd like to learn, Mark. Okay, great. Well, so, um, and by the way, I I don't know if I'll ever be invited back on the show or not, but I um, oh, I have, I, oh, have yes. a, I have a few hundred more um, ideas for things that we could cover. So if you if you want to have me back at some point in time, I'd be thrilled to come back. And I've got a lot of um, a lot of great landscape techniques to share. I'm also going to be re beginning recording a um, landscape photography video to uh, landscape photography with Photoshop video tutorial series that I hope to have released sometime this summer that will cover some of these techniques or many of these techniques um, all of the ones we're doing today and many more I hope so um, alright this next uh, Mark can yes. I just ask what tool do you use to capture your on-screen action for your tutorials oh so how am I how am I recording those tutorials I'm using um, I'm on a Mac so I'm using a piece of software called snaps pro and it records my voice, which I feed in with a microphone, and it records whatever's happening on the screen. Uh, okay. On the PC side, I think Camtasia, uh, at least it used to be a good solution. I haven't researched it in a while. but So Snaps Pro on Mac, Camtasia on PC. Wow, I actually own Camtasia, and I didn't even know you could do that. That's yeah, great. yeah. Like I said, I haven't worked with Camtasia in probably about, I don't know, six or seven years, so hopefully it still does what it used to. Um, all right, so I don't know about you guys, but as a landscape photographer, one of the things that uh, challenges me the most when I'm doing grand scale scenics, so you know those big beautiful landscapes, one of the things that challenges me the most is um, I'm pretty good at scouting and finding um, a spectacular foreground in a killer location. So maybe I find a meadow of wildflowers or a great reflection as my foreground and I'm in a spectacular location so I've got an awesome background you know mountains rising up but the challenge for me the thing that I struggle with most is oftentimes when I find that great foreground and I find um, that great foreground in front of that awesome background my middle grounds is maybe too spacious or it's a little bit dull and um, I I always wish 
there were ways to minimize the middle ground uh, because what I'm really trying to express is look at this unbelievable uh, pocket of wildflowers in front of this mountain with alpenglow on it. This is what I want you to see and that middle ground might be detracting from the photo because it's just uh, there's too much of it or it's it's dull and uninteresting. So um, I came up with a technique a few years ago. This is, um, Carl will hopefully share this link. I have a Photoshop workbench uh, tutorial on my website that relates directly to what I'm going to show you here. Um, and like I say, if she shares that link, it's, it's, a, it's about using content aware scale yeah. to compress the middle ground so that the audience really focuses on the foreground and the background in your scene. And um, so it's a neat trick for doing this. Go ahead and get this image open. Uh, in, in this particular scene that you see here, um, I like the middle ground. I actually wouldn't really compress it in this scene. However, um, that's not the case for a lot of what I shoot, so I might want to compress it a little. Um, this technique won't allow you to compress it you know, substantially, but it will give you definitely um, a little bit of improvement in the photo. Now, in order to use content-aware scale in Photoshop, you need to be working on just a normal layer. Background layers are finicky little creatures. They are locked, and they won't allow you to do a lot of things to them. So before we get started, we need to unlock our background layer. And to do that, all you have to do is double-click on the name of the layer. So I'm going to double click here on background. And I just want to check in make sure everybody's still there. Are you still there? Mm -hmm. We're, we're okay. here. Mm -hmm. Great. So when I double click on background, a new layer dialog pops up and it says it's named the layer, layer zero. Perfect. That's all I need. When I press OK, notice how the lock that is associated with this background layer over to the right of the, the name will disappear. When I press OK, the lock disappears. This is no longer a um, finicky background layer. It's now one that's going to allow us to do what we need to do. So we want to compress the middle ground, make it, make it less. So we're going to begin by selecting the areas that we cannot and don't want to affect. So in other words, if you're trying to compress the middle ground, you really want to protect the mountains or the top of the scene and the wildflowers or the reflection, whatever's in the bottom of the scene. I want to protect the, those two regions. I don't want them to be affected in any way. So I'm going to use the lasso tool to make a selection um, around the area that I'm, go that I'm getting ready to affect and I'm going to use that selection to protect the other areas. Let me show you what I mean. Here is the lasso tool right here. And I am going to freehand draw around this middle ground. So I'm drawing, and by the way, I'm able to draw outside of my um, document because I tap the F key to go into what's called full screen with menu bar mode. And full screen allows you to draw outside the edges of your document, which is kind of handy in a technique like this. So the F key will allow you to do that. If you tap F once, you're in full screen with menu bar. If you tap it again, you lose the menu bar. You go into a different type of full screen mode. And if you tap F a third time, you wind up back where you started with your document, either in tabbed view or in um, just regular floating document view. So I am moving through here, selecting the middle ground, and I'm going slowly. Uh, normally I'd go a lot faster than this, but uh, when I came back to where I started and let go, um, it drew a, sh a line between where I let go and where I started, because I wasn't exactly sure where I started drawing that freehand lasso selection. So as long as you get close, when you let go, it'll draw a straight line between where you let go and where you started. So now I have this area selected, and um, it is the area I want to affect.
protect, but it's not the area I want to protect. And I'm trying to set up protection for the mountains and the foreground. That means I need to invert my selection. So I'm going to go up to the select menu here and choose inverse. Is everything still flowing where you guys are seeing my, my menus at the same time I'm yes. saying them? Yes, it's That's working right. perfectly. Right. So I'm going to go to select inverse and it's going to invert the selection so that now the, uh, the top is selected and the bottom is selected and the middle is unselected. So these two areas, the top and the bottom, I don't want to affect so I am now going to go up to the select menu and save this selection. Now by saving it, I'm going to be able to use this selection in just a moment to protect these areas. So I'm going to the select menu and I'm choosing save selection. And I'm going to call this protect. And I was typing when I said that, so I'll repeat it. I'm going to call this protect because that's what I'm trying to do here. And then I'll press OK. All right. I've done, my, I've done all the heavy lifting. Now we just get to have fun. We're going to um, deselect these marching ants, make them disappear by choosing select, deselect. Okay? So select, deselect will make the marching ants disappear. Don't worry. You saved them a moment ago. You're, you're going to be able to... Um, re-employ them in just a moment. Now, here's, here, like I say, here's where it gets fun. I'm going to choose Edit Content Aware Scale. And Content Aware Scale will allow me, it, it's going to allow me to compress the middle ground and it's going to be using these just unbelievable little algorithms that Adobe came up with that um, do unbelievable work for you. Um, I'll show you here. So edit content aware scale. Before I begin scaling to compress the middle ground, I want to make sure that I bring into um, action the protected selection that I had a moment ago. So up here in the options bar where it says protect, I want to change this from none to protect. So in other words, I'm choosing the saved marching ants, the save selection that I saved about two minutes ago. Um, if I would named that something else, it wouldn't be called protect. It would be whatever I named it. So there we go. Now I'm going to hold down the Option key on the Mac, the Alt key on the PC, and I'm doing this because that will scale in from the top and the bottom simultaneously. If you don't want to scale from the top and the bottom, simultaneously. You don't have to hold down Option or Alt, but I'm going to press that down. And then I'm going to grab... Okay, we lost you from, and I'm going to grab. Okay, that's because I was holding down the Option key. I touched the keyboard again. All right, so I'm going to, I'll explain this all, and then I'll actually do it. I'm going to hold down Option or Alt. I'm going to grab the top handle, and I'm going to drag downward. Watch what happens to the scene. What you'll see is the middle ground will be getting compressed. The mountains and the sky and the uh, reflected, reflected area down below won't be getting affected at all. Here we go. I'm going to hold down an option or alt, and here I go. Did you see that? Did you see that happen? Oh my gosh! <laughs> that, that's so, what they did. That's what they did on that card I was telling you about of the the peaks in um, the San Francisco peaks in Flagstaff. Just that exact exactly. And this this would actually allow you if you had an eight by twelve um, proportion, and you needed to print it as an eight by ten, and you weren't willing to actually crop your image, you could try Content Aware Scale, because now I have a shape that's different from what I had a minute ago. In order to commit this, uh, this change, and I did a pretty radical one there just to show you how, how good this actually is, and um, I did it so radically that it could, there could be some problems here, but we'll see them in a moment if there are any. Now I'm going to come up to the check right here in the options bar, and I'm going to click on this check to commit my change. 
and in a moment it's going to um, it's going to do all the math that's necessary so that I have a compressed hopefully nice looking middle ground and what's going to be left over is I'll have these transparent areas at the top and the bottom of the scene I'll show you how to eliminate those as my final final thing of the day but let me zoom this up I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut, which means I'm going to mute in just a second. But the keyboard shortcut for zooming, just because maybe you don't want to keep hopping back over to the tools in the toolbar there, like the magnifying glass tool, what you can do is you can hold down spacebar and command, and you can start clicking on your picture. And that will zoom you in. Spacebar and control on the PC, by the way. Spacebar and command on the Mac, spacebar and control on the PC, and then click. will zoom you in. Spacebar and alt or sorry, spacebar and option on the Mac, or spacebar and alt on the PC, and then a click will zoom you out. Um, so those are nice keyboard shortcuts for zooming in and out. Um, some people also like to use command um, or control plus or minus, which works too. But anyway, I'm going to zoom in. And I'm... I'm going to move around this picture a little bit and show you in the middle ground. And you let me know if you see any problems in here. If you're at 100% viewing this um, and you don't see any problems, then you don't have any problems. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't think I have any problems. I think I have a perfect... Not seeing any. Great looking middle ground. This is really an awesome feature. When when this came out in what was it, CS uh, five? Yeah. Trying to think when it came out. Uh, this was in CS well, was CS four or CS five, yeah, one okay. of those. Yeah. And it was like I thought it was black magic or something. I just couldn't <laughs> believe that you could uh, uh, squish just um, the uh, yeah that that stuff that really didn't add to your image. You had some great stuff on the left, some great stuff on the right, and it was just this uh, kind of vacant stuff in the middle that didn't matter and that you could just sort of compress it and magic. I mean it was really, uh, uh, I still think it's magic. This is just awesome. It is. I mean, it's it, what they're doing in there is. I mean, when you really think about it, it's it is um, <laughs> it is a form of computing magic. So here's before, and now I'll show you after. Yeah. So there's there's your before and after. Now, um, at this point, you have this checkerboard pattern at the top and bottom of your document basically there's n there are no pixels there anymore to get rid of those transparent pixels you could crop and that would be fine or you can save yourself time by choosing image trim if you go to image trim and in the trim dialog you trim the transparent pixels and you trim them away from all sides. So I'm trimming transparent pixels from all sides. I really only have them at the top and bottom here, but there's no harm. But trimming from the left and right, because if there's nothing there, it won't affect it. So now I'm going to press OK, and I'm cropped. So, um, so that's the way to get rid of the transparent pixels there. Now we have an image with a more compressed middle ground. It's, it's a lot more about what's in the foreground and the background. Right, it really accents the uh, reflection there and your mountains. It really does emphasize those. Yeah. So um, I think that may be a good stopping point in terms of sharing techniques. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna unscreen share here and okay. see if I can see you uh, you folks again. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely want to do more of this. I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun for me. I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity. So this has been great, Mark. Um, just, it, it, just amazing. And now these words make sense. Simulating a graduated neutral density right. filter, meaning we correct 
did the light at the top and the bottom of the picture, replacing the skies, and then the using the content aware scale to compress middle grounds. I totally get it. You're gonna squish your picture. <laughs> so this is, you know, for me, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I've learned so much, and uh, uh, I'm sure that keystrokes and uh, different things here. We just uh, thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts for taking time from your busy day to share with us. And there was one thing I was going to ask, and I wrote it. Um, oh, Thursdays you have tips. Please tell us again how you find those tips, or do you have do you sign up for your email, or how do yeah. you get those Thursday yeah. tips? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, if you go to my website, ms or msjphotography.com, um, and you click on the Learn tab at the top of the screen, every Thursday you'll see a new Photoshop workbench posted um, on my page. And each week that's going to be a free tutorial uh, about something related to uh, being creative with, with Photoshop. And um, uh, those, those have been flowing out of me for, I think, seven, seven or eight years now. And so uh, I, I'm really having a great time with them still. And um, of course, if people want, would like to sign, my, um, sign up for my mailing list, you can do that. Um, on my site as well, and yes, I love to have I love to have visitors, and um, traffic is is a beautiful thing. So yes. <laughs> okay, well, um, we will definitely mark um, all of the links to all of the free um, tools that you are offering. We're going to do that in the summary, and uh, we're just ecstatic that you spent the time with us today, and we will continue to learn from you, and we'll. Definitely uh, have you back. Uh, we'll go over your hundred ideas for the shows. And, <laughs> and we'll just have a lot of content here, that's for sure. Yeah. And, uh, so we're at the part, part of the show where we end up and we uh, go through uh, photographers that, that, um, that anyone should watch, you know. And so, Mark, you be thinking about this, and Jeff, uh, because then what we do is it's just kind of paying it forward to someone that you've been watching that you think others might like to watch and circle, because it really is all about us circling one another, learning from one another, and that's what Margaret, when she started this uh, um, theme page, and the whole content was to help each other grow in photography, and we certainly have been doing that. So, Miss Margaret, we'll start with you and uh, your photographer to watch. Okay, let's see if I can do a screen share here. Uh, my featured uh, photographer is Ray Billcliffe, and I believe I've recommended Ray before, but he's one of these people that it's it's worth um, uh, suggesting him several times. He's one of the uh, uh, forefront of photographers on Google+. Uh, he must have like a dozen themes, a lot of which are landscape related, uh, like Swamp Saturday, and uh, he goes uh, off into the swamp and, and photographs grasses, um, the animals that are there, the wonderful birds and alligators, and uh, awesome sunsets and sunrises. He's just one of my favorite uh, photographers and one of the kindest, nicest people on Google+. Plus. So that's my recommendation. It is the great Ray Billcliffe, and if you're not following him, you ought to be. Take my advice and circle him. Look at his work. Uh, he's taught me so much, and this is just one of his photographs uh, that I selected here that that you're seeing an uh, awesome photographer and a really great person to get to know. So that's my recommendation for you today. Thank you, Margaret. Now, Tom, you have somebody for us to, to watch? I, I do. Let me put my uh, screen share on as well. It's, it's so fun. Um, actually meeting new people from this kind of a referral basis and, and if you're putting them in a circle and you can just watch the stream sometimes it's just fun to watch uh, the, the photos that they've posted and it's, it's so it is inspiring. 
Okay, the, the photographer I'd like to um, share is Mark Brodkin, who's based in Toronto, Canada. Um, can you see his picture here? No, you need to click screen share over on the left, Tom. I, I had. Yeah. Okay, and then um, then you need to click on the screen that you want to share, and we'll be able to see it. Why don't we do this? Why don't you try and figure that out? I'll share my screen, okay? okay. And uh, so then w you get your screen up there and we'll come back to you. <laughs> All right, so I, I actually have a, a cool story about um, uh, the person I would like to share with you today. Uh, and it is Jerry Kittle um, from uh, Prescott, Arizona. And we actually got to do a uh, photo walk at Cataract Lake on uh, Saturday night before we went to the Grand Canyon. And um, he is um, Medicine uh, Studios, uh, Medicine Tree Studios. And he is, does incredible work. These were, right, this is like five, not even three minutes from my house. And these are bald eagles that he got while we were waiting for the sunset. And uh, so um, there's just one of the sunsets uh, with the water and the reflection. And uh, so our, I'll be done with uh, Jerry and hope that you'll uh, circle him. And he, what a wonderful man he is and um, just does great work. Are you ready for us, Tom, or couldn't get your screen up yet? You'll see it down on the bottom if, when it comes up. I, I have it on now. Oh, okay, great. Go. We're gonna I, switch. We're gonna switch to you, and there it is. So go ahead. I admit, uh, Mark Brodkin in Yosemite last fall. I was on the way over to do some photography on the east side of the Sierras, and um, we met up at Glacier Point. We were both shooting the sunset, and I talked him to staying a little bit later and getting the moonrise over over Half Dome, and then. Over the next couple of days, I had ran into Mark a couple of times on the east side of the Sierras, and he wasn't on Google Plus, and I, I tried to convince him to get involved with it, so he, he has been. Um, this happens to be an image he, he took on the trip uh, Cathedral Lakes. It's an interesting story because he hiked out to the to lakes um, one day to try to capture the sunset. He made a mistake in the trail, got completely lost, ended up having to come back a second day, and he, he captured this image I'm showing now. But um, he's an excellent landscape photographer. I've had the uh, was able to photograph with him um, in December as well. He was in my area and spent a couple of days with him, and I, I certainly learned a lot. So I, I think highly of his work and want to recommend him today. That's great, and we'll put them on there. So Jeff, do you have someone, or is this a little short I, notice? I I have someone, and uh, I have a distinct theme here, and I'm going to see if I can. All right. Make this work the way you go that over everybody to else here on the left. And uh, Mark, if you've and got someone, just get your get your image up, and that way we'll be able to go right to you. All right. Okay, we and we got you there. Can Jeff. you see mine? Yes. All right. Uh, this is Dorma Wigan, and uh, she's someone I've just encountered recently. And the reason I'm showing these photos is because I think Dorma does a fantastic job of walking around in her own locale where she lives and she sees things freshly and she frames them and she sees the artistry and what other people might walk right past or not spend a lot of time with and I think that this is encouraging and a very positive thing yeah. for a lot of people who don't have the opportunity to go to uh, National Monument uh, parks, but uh, they want to get more involved with photography in their own area. If they feel kind of intimidated by some of the spectacular things that they see on Google+, and there's a lot of really good stuff there, I, I like Dharma uh, as an example of people who can just walk out their door with their camera, go down the street a little ways, and by looking and seeing things, uh, spend some time and uh, increase the appreciation that uh, she has for photography and that other people can have for just being able to look at uh, stuff in their immediate area. Yeah. So that's, that's a, a Dorma Wigan. Lo lovely representation. And then over on the right, Jeff, just go ahead and paste it in our chat room and I'll have her. So now we'll go to Mark. 
All right. So yeah, I I, uh, I have to admit I didn't come to the table with anybody. So I've I, okay. I just came up with somebody who um who actually is not part of Google Plus yet. Um, I'm really trying to get him on Google Plus here. Uh, his name is Charles Needle. Let me share my screen. That's what's so fun about uh, sharing on Google Plus. We're getting all kinds of new people to come and um, and participate with us. Yeah, yeah. Well, his website. Uh, hopefully, you can see is it's CharlesNeedlePhoto.com, and um, Charles uh, and I have been teaching workshops uh, together over the past several years. Uh, we both, uh, when we're out there, we both. Uh, um, really try to kind of, um, in a very supportive, encouraging way, we try to uh, try to help push people to allow themselves to be um, as creative as they want to be. And so Charles does a lot with, um, uh, if you can see the images here on the page, he does a lot with macro photography. Yeah. And, and um, you, know, you see this water drops, droplets image. I'm going to be sharing one of these, I think, sometime this week um, on Google Plus. But uh, where we actually get these water drops on on a plate of glass, and you put some beautiful flowers beneath them, and you get this unbelievable <laughs> uh, kaleidoscope of color. And um, Charles also does a lot with uh, in camera multiple exposure. It's something that I know a lot of people have not um, explored before. But uh, Charles and I love in-camera multiple exposure uh, because it allows you to um, create scenes uh, from nature and, and various you know macro settings of where where the scenes look more impressionistic uh, than they do um, a literal photo. Uh, I'll show, scroll down here see if I can um, share a few more of of, of his images. Um, oh, he and I are actually going to be teaching together in Nova Scotia. Here's some Nova Scotia images. Uh, we'll be teaching in Nova Scotia in October, but you'll notice like this this scene right here, uh, it has a beautiful kind of soft glow, ethereal glow to it, and that's done um, entirely in Charles's case. He does that entirely in camera, uh, but I think I think his macro work, his work with flowers is, and, and his multiple exposure impressionistic work with flowers is really some of the best that I've seen out there, and um, like I say, I'm, I'm really trying to encourage him to become part of the Google Plus community so, so he can share some of this magic with uh, a broader audience. Yeah, you need to get him get him to come join us. That, that sounds yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, that's, that's uh, wonderful, and thank you. Now we're, we're at our part of the show where we are telling you what's coming up, and uh, we have a surprise on the 21st of May, so you'll be watching uh, our, our landscape photography page um, to find that, but we do have a wonderful guest coming back, an instant replay with um, Dan Hughes talking about the HDR effects of the plugin for Lightroom, and uh, so I'm getting all these uh, terms down here, and <laughs> so for me this is like wonderful, and um, we want to invite each and every one of you to check out, and it will be included on the summary page here, the um, Google Plus second year anniversary photo walk that we encourage absolutely every one of you to either participate in or host in your uh, community. And we'll just leave that to the details to be coming, but you can be part of a history making worldwide photo walk event that's all free and all through Google on June 29th of this year so you have plenty of time to um, get ready for that and get a group together even if it's one or two of you you will have participated in this Google, Google photo walk and and so now Margaret has a special announcement from the landscape photography theme page um, we're starting a special event that will uh, start tomorrow, a photography contest. Uh, we want to see your best landscape, uh, one entry uh, per profile. So give us your best landscape shot, and then we also want people to 
come and vote on those images within the event. So call upon all your friends and neighbors to come uh, vote for your uh, favorite photograph, especially if it's yours that you've posted. And uh, whoever gets the most pluses out of that group wins. So it's real simple, real easy, and uh, we really are urging everyone to participate. The hard part will be picking just one photograph. And uh, we're looking forward to see what photograph Mark's going to share with us uh, in that event. So uh, that'll be posted tomorrow on Google Plus, and we hope that all of you will join us for that. So, Margaret, will that be in the form of an event? It'll yes. be called a landscape for photography event. Yes. And what happens is you're, you'll be invited to the event, click yes, so that you go to the event and then you just upload your photo. That's and it's it. It's kind of like dancing with stars, you know, get <laughs> whoever has the most social stroke gets there. So maybe we want the top five or something, but wonderful uh, opportunity to be sharing. And so we're thanking Mark again for coming and, and sharing those three powerful tips. We will be posting his website where you can get hundreds of videos on how to. And what a great, wonderful thank you, Jeff and Tom, for being with us today. And we will see you on May 21st. And we will also see you on June 4th. So watch our, uh, watch our posts and let us know what you think. And thanks. And you all have a nice week and peace. <laughs>